Let's return to the separation of immigrant families at the U.S. southern border and the impact this is having on the children. The president has changed course today to say that he will keep detained families together. But as John Yang tells us, there are many concerns about the shelters being used now and what's happening to the more than 2,300 children who have been separated. Judy, not many details were known about where and under what conditions the youngest children forcibly separated from their parents at the border are being held until the Associated Press reported the locations of three of them. To talk about what we do know about them and the psychological impact their detention can have, we're joined by Martha Mendoza, an Associated Press national writer who helped break the story, and Dr. Colleen Kraft, a practicing pediatrician who's the current president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. She has visited uh, one of the shelters where some toddlers are being detained. Uh, Martha, let me begin with you. What do we know about these uh, shelters, where they are, who's running them? Sure. We know of three in um, Texas, in the Rio Grande Valley area, and a fourth one that's planned for in Houston. Um, and they are run by nonprofits that run other children's shelters. Um, until March, they had been run by a group called International Education Service for about 30 years. These were shelters for youngest, youngest children. Um, but in March, the uh, government ended their contract, and so now two other um, nonprofits are running them. And these are being run, as you say, under contract to the government? That's right. Um, so the federal government's Office of Refugee Resettlement will contract with agencies to staff basically 24-hour daycare centers and take care of these kids. So these are centers designed for children? Well, actually, because um, until about a month ago, the children who were staying with their parents when they were very young. So these places had to be reconfigured to make them appropriate for such little children. And talk about that. For little children, I know that the, the, there is some discretion on the part of the officers at the border about separating children who are, I think the term is nonverbal, who aren't speaking yet. How young is too young to be taking these children away from what, you, from what your reporting has learned? Well, the federal government has what they call tender age, which is an interesting term. And um, some agencies say if you're under 12, you're tender age. Some agencies say if you're under five, you're of tender age. Um, I have not heard a minimum age at which they will you know, say this kid needs to stay with their parent. Kids who don't go into these group shelters are going to foster care. And today I spoke with um, the largest provider of that refugee foster care, Bethany Christian. Their youngest is eight months old. And what, what can you tell us about that foster care? Um, so they have 99 beds in Michigan and Maryland, and they assign kids to families who have some training and foster parent these refugee kids um, very young. And what they told me is that the kids are distraught. And um, that's also what we hear is happening inside these shelters. These kids are very, very frightened. Um, they fall asleep crying, and then they wake up crying. Uh, that's a good point to bring in Dr. Kraft. You visited one of these shelters in, in, uh, along the Texas uh, border, the Mexican border with Texas. Uh, tell us what you saw. So I visited the shelter in April of 2018, and the first room we visited was the toddler room. And we walked in, and the shelter is equipped with toys and books and cribs and blankets and it has a homey feel to it but the the children were were really remarkable when we when we walked in there when you normally walk into a room with toddlers they are loud and rambunctious and playing and moving around and these children were eerily quiet except for one little child who was crying and sobbing and inconsolable in the middle of the room Next to her was one of the shelter workers who was trying to give her a toy or trying to give her a book, and this child was not responding. The staff was, was not allowed to pick them up or touch them or console them. And as an observer and a pediatrician, I felt totally helpless because I know that child needed her mother. And I knew that all of those children needed their mothers. When you have toddlers who are not interacting with other toddlers and just quiet and looking at you, 
that's just as abnormal as that child who's crying and wailing. And the president, of course, has signed an order this afternoon ending this practice. They're going to be, uh, the families are going to be reunited. Is, does that end the problem or does this, do, has damage been done? So when you separate parents and children, these children have increased amounts of the stress hormones, the fight or flight hormones in their system, and that's already disrupting their development in terms of social emotional bonding, speech language, and gross motor. And they've been traumatized, and so reuniting them with the parents is the first right thing to do. The question is the implementation. When does that happen? How does that happen? Does this family unit stay in a place that's comforting or in a place that re-traumatizes these children? So there's a lot of questions in terms of the implementation of the reunification. And how far in the future are we likely to see or could we see effects in these children, the effects of their detention? The effects of trauma and separation from parents is, is something that you can see lifeline problems with. The effect is much more highly manifested with the very young children and for children who've been separated for long periods of time, but can be problematic for any child. And we'll have to look at the lens of how do we heal the trauma that's already been inflicted and not have any more trauma be inflicted on these children and families. And are they likely to need care and treatment for this trauma in the future? Very likely we're going to need to see some trauma-focused treatment for these family units and for these very young children so that they're able to bond again with parents, so that they're able to speak and communicate and learn and develop. The, the administration officials keep saying that these children are being cared for in the best quality possible. But you seem to be saying that it doesn't matter, that, that the fact that they're separated from their parents uh, is, the, is the main issue. The foundational relationship between a parent and child is what sets the stage for that child's brain development, for their learning, for their child health, for their adult health. And you could have the nicest facility with the nicest equipment and toys and games, but if you don't have that parent, if you don't have that caring adult that can buffer the stress that these kids feel, then you're taking away the basic science of what we know helps pediatrics. Dr. Colleen Kraft, president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and Martha Mendoza, the Associated Press, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.